And then there's a collapse at, at the end, just as in for British coal. This is Western U.S. coal production. And to me, this is the most interesting of our regions. There's an almost complete early production cycle here that peaked in uh, World War I. And it's based on coal in Colorado. Uh, it's a major metallurgical coal was the major product supplied the Pueblo steel mill at the time. And also it provided locomotive fuel and, and local heating. And then in 1970, during the, the Nixon administration, the Clean Air Act extension was passed. And then that was followed during the Carter administration, the, the railroads were deregulated. And Burlington Northern bet the company on railroads to Wyoming for, for coal, uh, uh, coal trains to Wyoming. And you can see what happened. The, the production just took off after that. So this one, in this case, you get two different curves, an early curve and then a later curve. Now, I, I give here the long-term production fit here. It's 45 billion tons. And in each case, I'll make a comparison to reserves. We have to be a little careful. Reserves correspond to future production, but my long-term fit includes the past production. So in each case, I'll, I'll be consistent. When I make the comparison, I'll always include the, the current cumulative production. And in each case, it's, it's expressed as a percentage. In each case, it's less than 100% for, for the curve fits. Now, here are the long-term fits for the, the whole country. Uh, compared with reserves. The first U.S. reserves were done by Marius Campbell of the Geological Survey, uh, and, and he produced a, a, a number in uh, the, his results in 1913. He came up with about four trillion tons of mineable coal. Now, after the Second World War, Paul Averett took over the coal division of the survey, and at the time, there was severe public criticism by mining engineers of Campbell's work. It, the contention was that there was nothing like four trillion tons of mineable coal in the country. Now, Averett responded. He was responsible for U.S. reserves un until he retired almost 30 years later in 1975. And the way he approached it was to gradually tighten up the reserves criteria. So by 1975, he ended up with, he counted thicker seams, also not so deep, and a, a pretty severe requirement on how close you have to be to a measurement point, and a more conservative recovery factor. Now, presumably, these numbers are, are better. You can see the comparison with these are the curve fits. Um, and, but they're also 13 times lower than they were 100 years ago. This is Australia's, uh, Australian coal. Uh, Australia, as I'm sure you all know, is the world's largest coal exporter. It passed the US in this in 1984. This is the linearized plot, and it, this is a pretty good one. Uh, it, the, here, the projection for long-term production is 50 billion tons. This works out to 57% of the corresponding number for reserves. And this is very close to the world average. The world average is 60% for that quantity. Here are the residuals. Uh, again, it's a, it's a pretty good fit. The largest residual since 1983 is, is only one month. This is Chinese coal. It, China's the world's largest producer, passed the US in 1985. And with China, there, there are concerns. There, there are real issues about the reliability of the Chinese data. I can give you one example here. Uh, did Chinese coal production triple in two years during the Great Leap Forward? No, it didn't. But those are the numbers. You, you, don't, you, you don't have much choice in using them. Now, this is cumulative production. This is on a log scale, so you have to be a, li a little careful in, in terms of looking at it. The, the interesting thing to me about this plot is that you can see two eras, one for the Republic of China and then one for the People's Republic. And then there's a gap during the time of civil war and the time to, to recover afterward. But the trends are actually pretty close, which is surprising to me how consistent it, it is. Now, here's the comparison for the fits for long-term production with reserves. Now, you see some crosses here. These are, uh, in, the, in the, the reserve surveys, uh, the Chinese results were actually given by foreigners, not by the Chinese themselves. Now, China has something like 100 significant coal fields. And so the problem here, of course, is you simply you can't do this as a, a tourist. You can't, you can't get good numbers. Unfortunately, the Chinese themselves have only submitted, responded twice to the surveys, once in 1989 and once in 1992. And these differ by a factor of six. So you're still left with it. Who knows what, what, what's really there. Now, this is world coal production. Now, I have other regions. These aren't shown, but these are the, the spreadsheets are available online. Also, there's a discussion and tables about them in the, the uh, paper. Now, we can look at the sum of the historical fits. That's the, pardon me, that's the 
the, the blue curve here, and then we have the reserves. Now, there's a couple of ways we can characterize this. The, the, the historical fits are within a 14% range since 1995, uh, and so that gives you a sense of how fast they're fluctuating. Uh, we can also express them. They amount to about 60% of the corresponding number for reserves, reserves plus cumulative production. Now, both of these numbers, the, re the reserves and the curve fits, are completely different from what the IPCC assumes is available for production. The maximum use of coal in an IPCC scenario is 3,500 billion tons, which is five times larger. It's a much bigger number. And in this scenario, production is still rising in 2,100, so it actually implies something much bigger than five to one. Now, it raises the question, where does the IPCC get its coal numbers? Now, these come from two surveys of the World Energy Council, 1995 and 1998. It's the blue stripes on the, on the chart here. The World Energy Council has two categories of reserves. There's one called proved recoverable reserves, and that's what they mean. When, when people say Australia has reserves of 80 billion tons, that's the number they're talking about. Now, there's another number here called additional recoverable reserves. And if you look at the two numbers here, differing by a factor of five, this is an exquisite test of de Fays's law. Now, you have a choice. Which number do I choose? Now, the, the, the proper answer is people have been seriously interested at the world level in, res level in reserves for, for coal reserves for 100 years. Any world number that changes by a factor of five in two years, they're, they're probably both bogus. I wouldn't use either one. But you can imagine what happens. The, the, the UN, uh, the IPCC uses the bigger number in its scenarios, in fact, a little more than the bigger number. Now, the problem is that since then, even though the same um, scenarios are used, the categories collapsed. We're now about 20 times smaller. And so and then it raises the question, well, what do you put in the assessment report? Because the basis for the scenarios has collapsed. Now, the way this was dealt with is that the new reserve numbers were noted, and then there was this quote, an estimated additional possible resource of 100,000 exajoules. And to translate that, that's 5 trillion tons. So that's bigger than any number that appears on the chart of all types. But, but it's not done with a reference. So it's simply a, a made up number added in. Now, to complete this, we'll add in oil and gas. Uh, this is world oil and gas added on an energy basis. And you can see here, it's a little different. We got on a different track after the Iranian Revolution. It's a slower pace. And, and this has an interesting consequence when we linearize it. You see, you maybe need good eyes. You can see a change in the slope that you get with that. And what that means, it, it isn't that we change the, the amount of the long-term production, but we change the pace. So instead of reaching 90% exhaustion in 2047, which was the earlier trend, it's now 2067. And there's some coal regions. Af Africa has a similar kind of plot related to the building of the synthetic gasoline plants during the boycott times. Now, here are the long-term fits for world oil and gas. And the interesting thing here, I, I've, uh, this is the blue curve, and I'm comparing these with reserves, and these are exactly compatible with reserves. You could use either number. You're not going to get a, a different one. On the other hand, we don't really have a good range here yet. We don't have a kind of oscillating thing that defines a range. But in this case, the residuals are, have a, a, a nice structure, and you can go through the process of the creating the bootstrap replications and calculate a confidence interval. And that's this gray band here. And it's not quite as stable as you might like. It, it may end up a little bit higher than where we're going, but, but at least we're, I think we're, we're, we're getting there. We're not quite where we want to be. Now, we can convert these numbers to carbon dioxide. Uh, there are uh, coefficients for each of these. And add them all up. It's, they're plotted here on a cumulative basis. That's this curve here. And for comparison, I plotted the 40 scenarios. And the interesting thing you can see is we're below all of the 40 scenarios, and that will have a consequence for, for climate. Now, for the next uh, assessment report, there's a different structure. They're, they're using something called representative concentration pathways. They're RCPs. Uh, now, of these, there are four, and three of them are simply climate policies work backwards. So you, you set a certain amount of carbon dioxide forcing, work back and figure out what the production of fossil fuels must be to get that. But there's one which is, which is really the one to compare to, which is really unconstrained fossil fuel production. And that's this RCP 8.5. And you can see it's, it's, it's within the range of the, uh, the higher end uh, scenarios. So. 
Now, we can convert this to carbon dioxide. I use a model uh, by uh, Roger Schmitz at the University of Notre Dame for this. It's a public model that you can work with a spreadsheet. And, I, and I've tried several different models, and they, they all seem to give results of a, a peak. You can see here around 450 parts per million. So if you wanted to make a comparison, that's what you would see. Also, from the time perspective, it happens in 2065. That's actually pretty close to the year of 90% exhaustion for fossil fuels in the, the curve pits. And the way I interpret this is that it's not the annual production in any one year that matters, but rather the total that counts. And so that's, that's really, if you want to have a policy to change something, you need to change the total. If you have a policy that reduces production by 10%, but you produce 10% longer, you've, you've made no effect on the climate. You can also convert this, the, I've carried forward the confidence interval here, the, the gray band, and you can convert that to temperature. The IPCC recommends a three degree sensitivity, and that turns out to be about a tenth of a degree. Uh, my sense is this is surely less than the uncertainties in the temperature record or the projections. So in some sense, we've achieved the first part of our goal. We've reduced the uncertainties for fossil fuels in a statistical fashion to something that's less than what we're likely to see on the, the temperature side and the modeling. Now, to go forward from here, I need to talk about the emails that were released from the University of East Anglia. Um, this is now 2009. Uh, there have been some committee reports on these, uh, and I'll limit my comments uh, strictly to uh, things that are within my personal experience and things that we actually need to go the next step for in our calculations. Now, I was the editor for the microwave uh, transactions, and just to give some perspective on this, the microwave society, this is the main publication for the Microwave Society. Uh, it's different from a, sci a scientific organization. It's 10,000 people, but we might only have one main journal, whereas with 10,000 scientists, you'd have to have uh, 10 or 20 journals in that. And I did about 1,000 papers. I was the editor for 1,000 papers or so for them. Now, I'll, based on that experience, I, I'll try to interpret these quotes from the emails for you. In the first case, the way I would interpret it is that the editor would like to reject the paper and he has one negative review, and he's asking the reviewer to write another negative review. In the second case, the reviewer, apparently this request is okay, maybe not in the, in the substance of how to write the review, but at least uh, the response could because he says okay. In the third case, uh, this seems to me to be a kind of litmus test for uh, editors. Now, apparently the editor was not removed, as you, it might be suggest, suggested from the email, but rather was that particular paper was, was assigned, apparently, to a different editor. Now, I have to say, you know, my experience as editor, these, these are completely outside of my experience. I simply couldn't imagine trying to lead a reviewer and what coach a reviewer and what to say. I couldn't imagine telling a reviewer what another reviewer had said until I had all my reviews show them all at the same time, and I wouldn't tell them who wrote the other reviews. As a reviewer, I couldn't imagine saying okay to this kind of request. In fact, for students, if an editor ever writes this to you, don't say okay. Say, you know, let me talk to the chief editor, or uh, if that doesn't work, uh, let me talk to the author. I, I can assure you that any author that saw that correspondence would not feel that they were getting a fair treatment by the, the journal. And I should also say, since I chose a lot of associate editors, is that I actually appreciated having a range of views in my editors. We met often to talk about the range of papers we were seeing, and it was helpful not to on necessarily on specific papers, because editors had specific requirements, but to get some sense generally how to treat uh, area, uh, different areas. Now, the, the central figure in the emails is a man named Phil Jones, and he's the leader of the effort that developed the most important land, world land temperature record. It's the only one that goes back to 1850. And he's a lead author in the land temperature chapter in the assessment report. Now, as a result of the emails, there's an announcement by the British Met Office that they would review the series and then make a new temperature set.